Welcome to the Future Print Virtual Summit. It's day one of the event, which is all about young guns in print uh, and all about opportunities. So next up is a session on opportunities for the future of inkjet. And I am joined by Nick Jackson, who is a senior engineer uh, advanced applications team at Czar. So thanks so much for, for joining us today, Nick. Thank you. And um, I'll turn over to you to take us through uh, this look at the future of Inkjet, whenever you're ready. Okay. Okay, so I wanted to give this presentation to give a little bit of a rundown of some of the things that Zara has been working on recently and how they can really give some uh, people a kickstart into the industry uh, of, of Inkjet printing. So, um, Starting off then, um, Inkjet is still relatively young and evolving. So uh, certainly when I started at Czar uh, 12 years ago now, uh, almost straight from university, I, I kind of considered Inkjet to be more um, just like your home, on, home office printer, Inkjet printing, just printing graphics and labels and so on. But less than a year or, year or two after I started at Czar, there was the ceramics explosion, which really brought to the forepoint and the forefront of how industry actually can use inkjet in different ways than just printing graphics and labels. So um, in the past uh, couple of years then, there's been some recent developments that have really uh, added to these opportunities that we can do with inkjet printing. So for example, high laydown technology, which is something that I discovered a few years ago, which ma massively increases the throughput that you can get from, uh, from print hands, which has opened up some really interesting possibilities of what you can do. And then last year, we also announced the high viscosity capability. And this is really pushing the boundaries of what's possible with inkjet printing and opening up some new opportunities we haven't even considered before. But all of these opportunities then also be, uh, come with some challenges and this is multidisciplinary challenges for, uh, for inkjet printing in the future. So from this field of engineering, then you've got to consider the ink system designs for these two key new technologies. Inside of chemistry, then there's new formulations that you can do without the, con the existing constraints of inkjet. And also then for 3D printing, there's new mechanical properties. So higher toughness and flexibility and elasticity that you can get with the higher viscosity. And also from design and manufacturing. So probably a lot of people are aware now of, of how much of a revolution 3D printing is to tooling design and manufacturing different parts, things that you can't do with existing techniques. And then there's also the functionality that is added from things like haptics and braille and potentially embedded electronics in, in printing. So I'll start off then with a bit of an overview of SAR technologies and what makes SAR print heads interesting and unusual for inkjet printing and pushing beyond what we previously thought was possible with inkjet. So starting with TF technology then, so this is the true designed in recirculation that was originally launched in 2007 with the SAR 1001 print head. So this is a rough overview of how the actuator is designed. So you've got this big common inlet manifold to pull all the ink into the actuator. You've then got completely open-ended channels on both ends and the ink goes straight through those channels and then collects into the outlet on, the, um, on either end of the print head. So if you look on the side, of, uh, side view of this, then you've got your ink channel with the nozzle plate directly behind your ink channel. And you've got a very high flow rate of 100 to 150 milliliters a minute directly behind the nozzle, which means that the fluid is constantly moving so you don't have some sedimentation inside your channel, which has really helped with the ceramic industry boom a few, um, in about oh, nearly 10 years ago now. And that keeps sedimentation from, um, from occurring inside the channels. It's also self-cleaning, so as well as keeping sediment moving, you also keep any debris and air bubbles constantly moved away from the nozzles. And this also means that it's self-priming as well, because you're actively driving, filling those channels rather than just relying on capillary flow. Uh, we also find that because you've got this flow behind the nozzle, this uh, results in a much longer uncapped time. And this, um, we've had situations where we've left the print head running continuously overnight and for several days, in fact, and come back and then every nozzle has been firing immediately without needing to do any form of purging. And also because you've got the constant temperature from the ink system and constant flow, that means that you're always running at stable jetting conditions at your nozzle. So we've also got high laydown technology. So this is the technology that I developed a few years, about two, maybe three years ago now. And this allows for a massive increase in, in throughput from the print head. So to give an example then for the Lazar 1003 GS12 print head, so you can ejection rate of up to 165 milliliters a minute per print head. 
So this is compares to about 20, 25 milliliters a minute for the standard operating mode from exactly the same printhead. And this is just changing the way that the printhead operates. To put this volume into context then, you can fill a Starbucks Grande coffee cup in as little as three minutes with just one printhead. And then with our 2002 printhead, you double this ejection rate. So now you're looking at about 300 or more milliliters per minute per printhead ejection rate. So this allows you to do things like haptic effects and textures. So normally this would be done with a thick card substrate and you push that down onto an embossing plate to get your, um, your printed relief. But in this case, we can now print 80 micrometers varnish at 25 meters a minute from the 1003. And from the 2002, it's up to 130 micrometers at the same line speed. So you can get some really interesting textures and effect from this technology. But it also allows you to print braille. So that sample you see on the right hand side of the screen, that was printed with the 2002 print head. And um, with this, we've managed to do inspect Marburg medium for pharmaceutical packaging and up to 50 meters a minute line speed. So you notice there it says two times 2002. So you still need to do two print heads in series, but up to 50 meters a minute successfully printing pharmaceutical grade braille. And this is still quite a compact method and much, much faster than previous um, off offerings, certainly from inkjet. And this allows you to basically print at the same time as full color graphics on the same web press. And this also allows you to, to print structural effects. So structural effects meaning the gloss or luster requires reflecting of the light in order to see the effects. So you need quite a lot of lay down in order to see this. So normally this would be done in multiple passes of multiple print heads, but with high lay down mode, we're able to print up to 120 grams per square meter from a single print head, and obviously double this for the 2002, which means that you can now print these effects in a single pass rather than needing multiple um, overprints. So to give you some examples of high lay down mode then, so you see here this the label print, you've got these water droplets on the bottles on the left here. And if we zoom in on those, you can see you get a really interesting convincing effect of uh, condensation on these bottles, which gives a bit of a kind of standout effect. And then you can also uh, simulate embossed glass. So you can see the texture um, on this relief here. So all of the shiny areas there are printed 80 micrometers lay down of varnish. And then for ceramic tiles, you see all of these glossy effects that you can add to get a really Im uh, high impact from these tiles. It's a really interesting effect. So then we have high viscosity jetting then. So this is really pushing what we believed was possible with inkjet and really challenging the existing um, kind of mantras in inkjet printing. So normally when we refer to printing, we look at the Ernest organ number. So this is defined as the square root of the Weber number divided by the Reynolds number. So if you expand out uh, the components for each of those two and then simplify down, what you can see is you've got the viscosity on the top and that's divided by the density, surface tension and characteristic length under a square root. So this characteristic length we usually refer to as the nozzle diameter for inkjet printing. What you can also see then you can simplify this further into being a ratio of the viscous forces versus the kinetic forces acting on the ligature. So this has been studied in, um, in many, many occasions in the past, such as this diagram here reproduced, uh, reproduced from a paper by Darby, Darby et al. And from this, you can see that if the Ernest Orga value is less than 0.1, your kinetic forces dominate and that causes your ligature to break up too much and form satellites. On the other side, if your viscous forces dominate, then your droplets fail to break off at all. And then we'll put all of these together. You end up with this region here, which is the general operating window for inkjet printing. And this gives you a limit of about 25 centipoise to stay within this operating region. But actually, as we've shown last year um, and presented at a couple of conferences, we've managed to get a lot more than this. So I did a lot of work on this one over the past couple of years, and we've managed to get up to 65 centipoise with our standard jetting mode. So that's Ernest Orga 1.8. And we've managed to get as high as 100 centipoise with high laydown mode. And that's Ernest Orga up to 2.6 now. So it's a significant increase beyond what was previously thought possible. So these new opportunities then, there's also comes with new challenges associated with them as well. And it goes through the whole range of science, engineering and technology in order to help get past these opportunity, uh, these challenges and to realize these new opportunities. So starting then with the ink system design, particularly for high laydown mode. So we now have a situation where with high laydown mode, the ejection rate is higher than the recirculation rate for standard mode. We actually had an interesting example where we were testing a new ink system with six print heads all connected to the same print system and 6,003 print heads has a combined ejection rate of nearly one liter per minute ejected. And then you have to recirculate at a higher rate than that, which meant that we had to recirculate at 1.5 liters per minute. 
And in fact, when we were doing this testing, we had a 1.5 litre bottle as our reserve bottle and we ended up emptying it in just a couple of minutes. We had to keep refilling in order to continue testing. But then you have to consider that most inks, certainly ceramic and UV inks, are up at 40, 45 degrees. So you've got to heat this ink all the way up to 45 degrees every single time. And we found when we were trying to roll out this technology that we, um, OEMs need to upgrade their ink system to support this, because if they are running for standard mode, they need to upgrade to support this now. In the case of recirculating header tank systems, then you have uh, what previously used to be a vacuum compensated supply ends up needing positive pressure. So that completely changes the pressure sensors, the release valves, the air supply and systems for, for this to work. We also then have to consider that the fill pumps need to be upgraded as well. So the ink system you see on the right there, I was doing some testing on that one. And you can see there's a window uh, where you can see the level of the ink in the tank. And while I was printing, I could watch that level just decreasing rapidly before my eyes while the fill pump was struggling to keep up. So this is another impact, uh, aspect of what needs to be upgraded. And then obviously the heater power needs to be increased. So if you're jetting at 0.75 liters a minute, you have to heat 0.7 liters per minute of fresh ink that comes into the system. But then you also have to consider for designs for high viscosity as well. So we need to potentially handle these things very differently. So starting from cold then, so one of the fluids that I was testing was 65 centipoise at 70 degrees C and that jetted absolutely fine, but at room temperature. So the temperature in the lab was about 19 degrees on that particular day. And this fluid was 1,390 centipoise at room temperature. So it took me about an hour to fill up the ink system from cold while wafting it with a heat gun in order to get that into the system. So that's something that we need to think about for future applications. It's also a consideration for high particle loading with high viscosity. So potentially the membrane pumps that are quite common at the moment may not be suitable for certain high viscosity fluids going forwards. And then there's the issue of high, uh, high differential pressures required to get high viscosity. So differential pressure is calculated from this equation you see here. So you can see that as you change the viscosity, you change your differential pressure requirement quite a bit. And from this and the meniscus pressure, you can then calculate the supply pressure the printhead needs and also the return pressure. So you put all these together then and for a, a continuous meniscus pressure, you can see that with, the, um, with a low differential pressure and a target of, uh, 15, of minus 15 millibar meniscus pressure, you can see that even with quite extreme errors on your pumps, the meniscus pressure stays within the operating window of the printhead. However, when you go to high differential pressures, you can see that in certain cases now, the errors stack to result in meniscus pressures that won't re result in reliability. And if you look down right, far at the bottom right, you end up with a meniscus pressure of positive 10 millibar compared to the target of minus 15. So that means that we need to now control the meniscus to within plus or minus one millibar. So that offers a bit of a challenge for engineers of ink systems to, uh, to design systems to be able to cope with this. There's also a lot of opportunities from chemistry then. So mainly the key one is that there's much more flexibility in fluid formulation. So when I first announced, um, presented these results, these high viscosity data, there are a number of fluid formulators we were talking to who are rubbing their hands with anticipation of what they could do getting back into the lab to design for higher viscosity. So just some examples then, you can look at new functional group chemistries. So you can have more steric molecules that would normally be too viscous to print. And this can protect some of the functional groups inside your um, fluid until you go through curing process Processes. There's new base solvents possible, so you don't have to keep reducing your, um, your viscosity in order to keep your carrier fluids jettable. And um, you also potentially have less penetrating UV inks. So one of the things that I, um, I was learning quite early on in my, in my career in printing was that UV inks are quite penetrating because of the viscosity limit that they had to be produced for. And this potentially can be a problem for director shape applications for food packaging, where you don't really want your inks penetrating into the, the, uh, the contents, which could be causing problems. So this potentially allows us to relax that a little bit and potentially make less penetrating UV inks. It also allows us to increase the range of refractive indices for optic, uh, optical materials. So lenses and that kind of thing, 3D printing um, optical materials. And also then higher pigment loading because you have a better suspension stability. But what we're also seeing is that increasing the particle loading actually sometimes increases the elasticity. So this potentially means new dispersants and surfactants are required in order to keep things jettable for inkjet printing. But then, of, of course, the biggest opportunity is all the completely new markets. So previously, inkjet limited to 25 centipoise. There's lots of markets that we didn't even consider. So now we've got a whole new range of things that is adhesives and electronics and paints and potentially many more that we haven't even thought of yet. So there's quite a lot of opportunity there in particular of what we haven't been able to do with inkjet in the past.
And finally, for design and manufacturing then, so 3D printing is a very, very good example of how you can completely revolutionize manufacturing. And that's just simply because you can create complex manifolds and uh, parts that you can previously cannot do with casting or machining. And you can also embed electronics while building the part without having to stop and change and go through multiple step processes. You just add it during printing. It can, you can even print the electronics as well. But then it's also extremely scalable for additive manufacturing then. So the build length is just a case of printing slightly longer. So if you've got something that takes two seconds per layer to print all at once, increasing that build length by 50% is three seconds per layer to build the entire layer all at once. And then failing for build width, you either just print multiple sways, which is still four seconds per layer versus two seconds. So that's much, much faster than other processes. Or you just add parallel print heads for zero time increase. And then for multi-materials then, similar to cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, you just print stiff, rigid, flexible, elastic, and support materials, all print exactly the same time in the same layer. And you also vary the proportions of that during the part without requiring um, over overmolding effects. So this part you can see on the right here, then you've got rigid rings separated by a flexible bridge in the middle. And this was printed at 45 center points with the Tsar 1003 GS12 print head. And each layer was printed all in one go, all at the same time. So those, the joins between the two materials is much, much stronger than it would otherwise be. So in conclusion then, Inkjet's still young and we're still evolving into new markets and opportunities. And the advanced manufacturing section of um, at Tsar is really increasing in the potential of what, we've, um, what we're realizing we can do with Inkjet printing. And using high laydown technology, it allows us to go into high build applications, so braille and haptics and structural effects for ceramic tiles, and significant increase in build time for 3D printing, it should be added. And then high viscosity is really pushing what we thought was pre uh, we previously thought was possible with inkjet printing. And these puts, puts together results in some challenges, of course. So from the engineering side of things, you've got the ink system design and trying to um, plan this for future applications. And the chemistry side of things is the increase in the particle loading of high viscosity fluids, but without increasing the elasticity in response. Have any opportunities then? So in chemistry, you've got all of the new formulations possible. You've got the new optical and mechanical uh, properties. And then you've got all of these new applications that we previously rejected as not possible with inkjet. And from design and manufacturing processes, then you've got the revolution tooling design from additive manufacturing. And then you've got the new added functionality that you can add to labels and tiles and so on by adding in these uh, high speed braille and then also ceramic and lusters at single pass as well as much, much more beyond that. So there's a lot of opportunity that comes out from these new technologies. And really the, the emphasis here is that some of this requires a fresh perspective. So a lot of inkjet is limited to this 25 center poise limit. So having a, a new people coming into the industry with new ideas and new, a fresh perspective, not limited to the previous old um, kind of thoughts about inkjet printing can really help to revolutionize the future of inkjet printing. So thank you for listening. Nick, thank you so much for for taking us through that. That's really, really interesting. And it, it just really shows uh, how much innovation is, is going on in the space. So thank you so much. Um, if I could just get you to, to maybe um, expand on a couple of, of points. And, and first, it would be great to, um, you know, this this is all about young guns in print. We've had having a lot of discussions today about people's kind of personal journeys into the industry. Um, it would be great to, to hear your story and, and how you came to be involved in this industry and, and um, in your position at Czar. So um, I originally did my degree at um, Cambridge University and um, I, I then graduated with a degree in natural sciences, so chemistry focused. And um, after graduation, I started looking for, looking for jobs and I uh, actually had an agency approach me with this but, uh, with potential job for a waveform engineer. And uh, at the time I was thinking, what, what's a waveform engineer? I did, I, I did a degree in chemistry. And I decided to give it a try and give it a go, see see what it was like. Uh, ended up working for a kind of went into interview at this company called Czar on the Cambridge Science Park, and I'd never heard of Czar before. And the whole time I'd been at, no, at Cambridge, never heard of it whatsoever. So I went along for the interview, gave it a try, and it turned out that it worked really well with um, with kind of like with my mindset. Uh, started off as a waveform engineer, then gradually worked up into working on new uh, new technologies, the new actuator designs, then eventually started working on new technologies, and then eventually, on, as uh, mentioned earlier, on advanced applications. So with this um, kind of slowly working my way up from just being, here's a printhead, here's an ink, make it work, to having a new 
here's a new actuator. How do we make this work? And then it was new. We have this new application with Inkjet. How do we get this to work with Inkjet? So it's um, quite an interesting journey in that respect of so starting off with just something that's quite um, repetitive, but then working up into something that's completely unknown and every new application we work on is completely different. But the interesting thing with all of uh, kind of starting its arm was that I'd never heard of the company before. So um, kind of trying to get into the inkjet industry is, is an interesting one because it comes from two directions of you either you start off with that and you want to go into that industry or you've never heard of it before and you kind of stumble into there from your uh, science or engineering background and then you're applying it to this new field. Yeah. And that's so true. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a common um, challenge, I think, that we're, we're seeing in, in different areas. But I think especially, you know, um, on the chemistry side, on the, the engineering side, um, there's some huge opportunities. You know, everything that you just took us through is, is such an exciting area with so much uh, opportunity for, for, for discovery and for experimentation and for kind of moving uh, inkjet forward in particular. Do, do you think that, that, you know, you said you weren't aware, aware of Zara or the role that you were initially going for. Do you think there's, there's not enough being done to, to, to push that it's an exciting and, and rich area for people in, in, in science and studying those areas of science? Oh, definitely. I mean, um, things might have changed a lot in the 12 years since um, since I was last looking for a job, shall we say. But certainly, um, I think there needs to be a little bit more done to engage universities and engage students that otherwise wouldn't have thought of or considered inkjet as being an option. So I know that certainly there's the, um, the Institute for Manufacturing in Cambridge, where um, I believe you have some um, panellists in this session who are from there. Um, so potentially kind of seeding the idea more into um, so chemistry lectures and uh, chemical engineering, just to kind of get people a little bit more um, thinking about inkjet as a potential, well, a manufacturing industry for, for a start. So uh, as I said earlier, it's not just about graphics. So there's also the, um, the manufacturing and design element as well. So potentially in engaging students in those disciplines as well as just um, printing would probably be a good start there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely, more more needs to be done in that in that space, and and showing that it's you know because that was so, such an, an exciting look at, at everything that's that's possible. And I think especially um, it would be great to know a bit more about the the story behind the the high laydown uh, technology. You know, that's um, what an interesting thing to, to have worked on and to discover and to be developing. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, so high laydown was invented in um, kind of one of the ways a lot of interesting inventions are, which is completely by accident. So um, I was I was trying to develop something to increase the throughput. So we wanted to target this um, the ceramic tile effects, the gloss and luster that I mentioned earlier. And we were looking at some completely different technologies in order to do that. And I I made a mistake in the way that I was uh, operating the print head. And suddenly um, what I was measuring from, um, so we call it the 1003 GS12, and that means that it's a 12 picoliter grayscale head. So each, each droplet that comes out is 12 picoliters in size. So I was suddenly measuring 36 picoliters per drop. And repeatedly so i did it again and again and again and again and every single time i tested it it was always coming out as 36 picoliters drop size which didn't make any sense in terms of what i was trying to do versus what i actually did and then worked backwards and realized that actually this was a completely different way of operating the print head that we hadn't tried we hadn't considered before and then we looked at that and further it turned out it was much much more efficient so the 36 picoliters was because it was actually printing at something like 15 meters a second drop velocity rather than the normal six so dialing that back to six picoliters and uh, sorry six meters a second we ended up with something that was a very very efficient very energy uh, kind of very low voltage um very stable and um kind of very re relatively speaking reliable for the amount of throughput that we we're getting from that print head so um we're going from i think it was something like um 25 grams per square meter going up to more like 100, 120 grams per square meter from the same print head just by changing the way that it was operating. And it was discovered completely by accident, but it turned out to be much more efficient than we thought, first thought it was. Wow. I mean, that is, that is amazing. And I think it, you know, anyone uh, watching that is studying in, in that area or interested in that area, I mean, that just sounds like a, an incredible thing to, to be a part of. 
Um, and, you know, I, thank you so much for, for sharing that story and, and all the, the information that you've given us today. Really, really interesting uh, look at the opportunities for the, for the future of inkjet. So thanks. Yeah, so it's, it's all a case of just trying something different and seeing, seeing what works and um, just having an open mind, really. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, very well said. Thank you so much, Nick, for, for again for that. And thank you to everybody uh, who has joined us for this session. Um, there's a huge amount more of, of fantastic sessions, so please stay with us for the Future Print Virtual Summit. Thank you. Thank you.